It is common knowledge that corruption and bad leadership has been the bane of Africa's underdevelopment. Many have advanced reasons on how best this menace can be curbed. And it is within this theme that today on Frank Talk, we will be looking at citizen participation and the anti-corruption drive. Good morning, I am Alpha Jagden. With me in the studios is a management consultant in person of Mr. Kunle Lawal. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you very much, it's my pleasure. All right, let's begin with the basics. Can politicians in any way or form curb the unacceptable high rate of corruption in our society today? Um, you know, it starts from, the, it's a holistic system. You cannot separate um, integrity, integrity of a leader from the corruption angle. The truth is, you must be Nigerian and want to further Nigerian ideologies. If you are attached to your country, then you can fight corruption. Corruption not only is stealing money as we see it, but it's also the abuse of power and office. That's right. Now, as we move on, how can the citizenry now know that, listen, if it is bad, it's because we allowed it. If things are good, it's also because we participated. You see, for the citizens, what we must learn to understand is that Nigeria comes first, beyond our ethnic, religious, or whatever sect we decide to divide ourselves in. We must first create a new tribe known as Nigeria. Now that Nigerian tribe is what will drive and help us believe in the, in the goal of what we are actually supposed to achieve as, as, as Nigerians. And this, this box stops at, let's look at it this way, you're in the bank, you try to beat a line, you're already corrupt. Yes, when right. last most of us get driver's licenses uh, correctly, correctly, we will just go by the side, pay somebody a little cash, no driving school lessons, and then you know go ahead. All these small things tend to form the big, whole, holistic situation we find ourselves in. You know, talking about awareness, what do you make of the level of awareness as far as these Nigerian goals are concerned? I'm not talking about those in position of leadership now. I'm looking at the citizens because that really is our thrust of discussion this morning. Well, for me, I think um, the not to sound biased, I think the media has a serious part to play. I I wouldn't say I'd say government agencies that are supposed to be sensitizing Nigerians on the ideas and Nigerian goals have not reached their full potential. So I feel the media has a lot of things to pay. Like let's look at somewhere like America for now. The basic movies that come out of America drive the American goals. You know, no soldier is left on the battlefield. You are actually driven by all these things. These things tend to affect the psychic of the citizen. Now, in Nigeria, our movies, I don't need to tell you what they seem to promote. <laughs> no, no offense to Hollywood. But to create this whole, change the psychic of the citizen, it starts with little things. Even, the, even from school, the way we... We are taught the way we are addressed, the way we the media expose things. And you know, we come to see a situation where something happens in the country, and a media house or a, a radio station would say a Hausa man in 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 Lagos or a Yoruba man in Kanu. Those are things we are not even supposed to say. You understand? It kills the Nigerian dream. That's right. And as we move on, we are still talking about awareness yeah. and how to bring up the society. Back in those days, as kids. The Nigerian factor was part of the school curriculum. Can we make same of today? Can we say same of today? <laughs> as far um, as issues that bother on nationalism, nothing. patriotism, and what have you, good governance, you know, um, as a citizen, your responsibilities to the state, as government, your responsibilities to the citizens. Do you think that that truly is out there in the open? Um, I don't think it's there in the open. Um, I volunteer teach in, in a secondary school in Meitama. And um, there's one thing I've noticed. I think somewhere along the line, I don't know how it skipped totally our whole c curriculum. It's now just basically you just learn normal things, uh, English, maths, physics, government. And for me, if you do not understand, I think our basis then was in social studies. Yes. That's where you were taught That's the basic right. at primary school. Yeah. At the, I think at primary school yes, and, then yeah. uh, school and then yeah. sec first three years of secondary yeah. school. You were taught the basic understanding yeah. of what it was to be Nigerian. You were taught about other cultures. I can't say, I'd like, I don't expect somebody in secondary school now to wake up and say, okay, the North culture was known for this. Yeah. Or they, those are things they don't even know they about. And, that, and we are actually alienating the next generation from a, a 
I think we have in the alienated culture. them already. Yeah, and you know, there's this principle to life that if a man doesn't know where he's coming from, he mm. cannot know where he's going to. And, right. and I feel that's what affects our system presently. How can we begin to change the psyche of our people? Well, we all seem to know where we've gone wrong. But why is getting it right that a problem? I think this is where the politicians come in. I think for the purpose of politics, the way Nigeria has run its politics, it has always been a regional political system, meaning uh, this person comes from the north, the north votes for him. This person comes from the west, the west votes for him. So I feel if they tamper with that status quo. Can we trace that maybe to our history? <laughs> how we emerged? Yes, yes, yes. From the regional to... Yes, but those regions were not created for that. They were created for competition and for diversity and operational and uh, simpler, uh, simpler op uh, operational efficiency yes. from the central. But we have, of course, mm -hmm. uh, with everything comes another fiddle. So, you know, everything, of course, has another side. So, of course, for, po for me, politicians wouldn't want to, I don't think anyone in politics would want to play that real card now that to real, because if it is reorganized, I don't think, I think about 80% of the people we find in elected positions wouldn't be there. When we zone, let's say the presidency, to okay, for the sake of oneness and for the sake of participation, sense of belonging, you say, all right, this should go to the north, it should go to the south this time or what have you. Um, is that the way to go? No, I don't agree. I've never agreed with federal character. I'm more of a uh, meritocracy. And I think one of the things one of the things that actually hurts Nigeria the most that we've never concentrated on is the actual state uh, state of origin. I'm more a proponent of state of residence. Because let's be honest, I can't pay my tax seventeen years here than someone that's living in London that's just He's ancestrally from here. Would just come and say, okay, he's running for election here. I'm more here. I, I pay more. I pay my taxes here. I know what's going on. I can tell you what's on the street. I can tell you why the street lights aren't working. I understand how it is, and I feel that state of origin has really, really, really compounded our problems. Really. All right. So you would rather say state of residence? Yes. All right. Now, as we move on, we are looking at citizen participation. We are looking at societal ills because we know that corruption, no doubt, is the one that seems to be at the front banner. What do you make of the current stance as far as the anti-graft agencies are concerned? What's your personal opinion concerning the fight against corruption and the role they are playing? For me, <laughs> the anti-graft... Okay, let's start from a holistic view. I think um, those agencies should all be under the office of the Attorney General an answering to the Attorney General. Not the rigma role we kind of have now and presidency kind of controls a few things. For me, it helps decentralize one and two, helps, you know, the anti-graph agencies actually go after those they mean to go after. I feel its, oper its operations have been a little selective in, in terms of who they go after and who they don't go after. Well, even if it is under the AGF's office, it's the president who appoints, even the AGF himself. No, I mean, not, uh, well, yes, even yes, the AGF, yes. yes. Um, you, know, when I <laughs> you know, when you go when you go through Nigeria, you find out we have quite a lot of <laughs> structural yeah. anomalies. Yeah, well, but, you know that, that, stop, that is why we stop, have a program like yeah, this. Yes, we stop the actual function of this. I don't think the president should. The president can nominate, but not appoint an AGF. I think that's what's done in other countries. And it's funny when you have that in Nigeria because it actually has the, the presidency controlling the judiciary. Mm. You know, you are the publicity secretary of Koa Party. Yeah. I want to hear from you. Do we need the number of political parties we have in Nigeria as it were today? Um, as of now, we have about 48. 48. Um, as the last yes, uh, 9X says probably before 2019, we would have probably 90. At the rate it's going. <laughs> um, for a healthy democracy, you need multiple democrat democratic parties. The number we have, I feel, is a little wild. And I feel it's also a subject of our regional operations when it comes into politics. You know, this party cannot take care because the head is from so, so place. So, you know, you have to create another political party that fits here. And then, uh, but that said, looking at the agitation now for young politicians coming up. They can't seem to strive in, I, 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 I've risen to a national publicity secretary, and of course I'm more 40, so I'm lucky. That's but right. I don't think people have opportunities in the big two mm -hmm. to, to be that. So I think 
you, the youth in this country have also decided to come out with their own political parties, you know, to try and create a level playing field in which they too can assume position, become a chairman, become become a national secretary, or, and then also vie for things like president. So it's a 50-50 it's a thing. Yes, it's, it's not good the number we have, but, you know, when you look at the situation we have on the ground, it might be necessary for some of You know, as you meet people during your political campaigns, your rallies and what have you, do you think majority have given up on the Commonwealth? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's hard being a Nigerian. You, you know, systems fail unnecessarily, that's health, education, they, they are all failing at the same time and nobody seems to care. And then there's this flamboyant lifestyle of ele elected officials that you have to live up with, which you, you just tend to say, oh, come on, everybody's the same. You understand? You, no matter how you try to preach, and they will look at you, ah, he's preaching only because he hasn't got there. The moment he has, he has gotten there, the SUVs come out, the, the mobile police, the cars, you know, the, the treating abroad, and <laughs> so whatever you have, That's the right. whole nine yards. Mm. But as we continue to lament, it appears we are also not doing enough to correct this. Yes, thing. yes, yes. You, you know, one of the greatest mistakes you can make in a democracy is lament and choose not to participate because if then if you choose that then you are held responsible for the kind of government you have because you stood back and, you, and i think there's been a wrong way we project political participation in nigeria political participation is seen as voting that's what the NOA tells us that's, that's what right. INEC tells us but wrong political participation goes into actually running for office and then also holding leaders accountable. That's now, those are two pla parts that are underplayed by most government agencies. That's right. And to a large extent, it's because the people are probably not even aware yeah. that beyond going to vote, that is where it starts. If your candidate does emerge or he doesn't emerge, it is your yeah. responsibility to put pressure on the system to see that leaders are accountable to the people. Yes, and I feel that's the whole the whole thing about government. Leaders must be accountable to the people. That's what government is basically based on. All right. You know, as we move on, youth participation, you mentioned it. What are the prospects of the Nigerian youth coming not just to seek for elective office, but to see that, listen, the future truly is ours, and what we make of it today will depict our tomorrow? I think um, sometime earlier, especially with the advent of social media, I think we have started to see in pockets that, um, okay, most of us participated in, that's my generation, participated in bringing a lot of people into power, into office. And you know, they've, they've hurt us. And I think my generation is also tired of carrying ballot boxes <laughs> that are running, running around. And I think it's a little insulting for, for us to be accepting personal assistance and special assistance at age 40. Well, maybe it's a starting point. It's not the starting point. I served as a personal assistant at the age of 26. Do you expect me to now serve as a personal assistant again at, four, at the heading towards 40? I don't think so. I'm, I'm going to be moving up. So, of course, I'll start looking at probably contesting elections. And we found out that, okay, if you could deliver someone into office, why can't you deliver yourself into office? It's the same process. It's just a fair. I think we're raised with a system that, you know, of course, the African culture system, which says respect your elders, do this, that. I think it has blinded us to seeing the opportunities we actually could But have. to a large extent, how many, of, how many people your age bracket have, that, have this understanding you have? Because well, a lot of people have like, folded <laughs> their arms and it's their <coughs> thing. Let them do it. Um, well, what I, I've, 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 I've seen pockets of um, campaigns that have started. A few, for a few friends are running for president. Um, a few people running for governor. A few people running for president. Yes, All right now, right, right now, I can, I can. I was part of a young aspirants conference that had over forty people mm. running for election, and you know that that's a great thing to see. It's not about them winning; it's about them realizing they have the potential to that's achieve right. this dream. And and when you look at it, the whole the tide of the world right now is even turning towards younger politicians. That's so. True. So um, it's not it's it's not a it's not a function of um, Nigeria exactly. It's actually the whole world tilting towards a new direction. Because the truth is, these days you have to run a country, a country as a business. 
you can't run it again just as a, a territorial barrier. Yeah, as a ter charity organization or a territorial boundary. Mm -hmm. doesn't work that way. You run a country as a business. You make strategic alliances when you need to make strategic alliances. You put here, you put here, and you invest, not, uh, how do I put it? Like, I'll, I'll give you a simple example. For, for this is my take on agriculture. Okay. Yes, we are saying go back to the farm, go back to the farm, go back to the farm. It's a great idea. But I find it kind of, I wouldn't call it nomadic, I don't know, I find it traditional. Because looking at it now, if we, let's say, export cocoa of, let's say, about, um, let's give or take $3 billion, and we get it out, I'm sure Nigerians will be happy. Sure. But you'll be happy, but look at, the change, look at the trend of things. You're going to be importing beverages, chocolates, mm -hmm. and coke for about $10 billion, which the, means it gives you value, a deficit of $7 the billion. Value, the value yeah. chain is, <laughs> the value is, chain is not just so, so you are actually not processing anything, and then you are taking, you know, you are taking it out and you shout about $3 billion, then you are sending $10 billion over something that was bought from you. That's so right. you've lost seven. Well, it has dollars. always been the case, I know. <laughs> you've lost seven. To a large dollars. extent, our economy has largely been import substituted. Most of these things you export and then you bring them back as finished goods, and most times you are having to pay more. But there still is a problem, and it's a problem that needs to be sorted out. Some of the things that are even locally produced are more expensive than some of the things that, uh, and you know, just by the way, and some of the problems we have is packaging and what have you. They go back to the farm thing as you just mentioned. It's a laudable project. It's a laudable idea. But most times, what I tell people is, have we formed ourselves into cooperatives? Have we formed ourselves into stands where we can take care of an overflow, perhaps that were to happen? Because if everybody goes back to the farm, and if the kind of statistics we're hearing is truly what it is, I want to believe in no distant future there will be a growth. Let's say something like rice. Let me put it properly. Mm. There will be no growth till we have processing industries here. Yeah. That's the truth. No, I said glove. Okay, glove. <laughs> okay, yes. okay. Because, I, I mean, that's true. We don't have the industries. We don't have the processing okay. industries here. Mm -hmm. So we continue making the same mistake. You ship and then you take outside, then you buy back from people at no, a higher no, price. No, no, no. You know, what is the sense in that? Really, what is the sense in that? So if somewhere like Britain can sell so much from milk, Britain, Britain makes money from cows. Mm -hmm. Come on, what's the, what's the size of Britain? <laughs> Britain is just like maybe Abuja, Kogi, and Kwara states. That's the size of that size of Britain, and and of course they are, they are main stand, and we are nowhere. It doesn't doesn't make literal sense, and that's because we do not we do uh, government. From there's one thing that government needs to do. We need to shy away from buying kekena peps, wheelbarrows, and all that crap. We need to start looking at, okay, if I invest in so so cooperative. Or if I invest in this company that is Nigeria. But why always government? Why not private citizen participation? If government has to lead the train. Yeah, well, if you study, if you study. Probably to make the environment yeah, conducive. conducive. Yes, government has to lead the train. Like for now, if if I were Dangote, for example, I walk into a bank, I can get one billion naira. You need to see the amount of stuff I need to go through to borrow 200,000 from the bank. I understand. Till that system is changed, we won't have thriving businesses, we won't have thriving ideas, we'll just have, of course, their private business doing better in Nigeria, but it's not, it's not at its potential. We have a market, we have actually the, f the largest black population in the world, fifth largest in the world, but that's of people. So one in five people are blind. So what, why do we lose such a market? Just because we have refused to organize or streamline things that we're doing. Number one, money should be easily accessible. Two, we should work on light and electricity, that is. Power is everything. That's I can right. assure you that if you can just make power available, available. business will be a lot better in That's Nigeria. Right. They, Nigerians are, they are, don't like, they are very resourceful. Really resourceful. Mm -hmm. Working with system. If you give them light, I will tell you, they might not even need government intervention to start to bring up processes. With what you have just said, it means there is hope, and it also goes to say that, listen, we can have the country of our dreams. Yeah, so it actually it, it lies in our hands. The choice has always been in this generation, this generation, next generation. And right now, I think the honors comes to my generation. That's between 30 and 45. Um, and I think there's that drive. They really want a country that is different. Because I look at, I have, I have a one-year-old son, and I look, I look at the country I want to hand over to him. It's definitely not what, I, what I'm going through right now. You know, politics, we cannot dissuade from all you are talking about. Understanding these things is quite what does matter. 
Because where we don't have this understanding, I'm afraid we'll keep on going around the same old circle. Yeah, you know, um, I think most of our programs in Nigeria, or most of the things I've had to listen to in Nigeria, are not structured to intellectual to promote intellectual thought. Mm -hmm. We kind of have um, TV programs that are just interviews. Okay, here is the, for example, head of customs. This is that, that, that. So what do you feel? How much is customs making? That, mm -hmm. does, that, that doesn't make anybody think. No intellectual <laughs> there's no inter mm -hmm. there's, there's no intellect There's no intellectual exchange. Mm -hmm. So it's just a, as he said, she said situation, which is what you find across the board, even be some most of the time social media by my own generation. I did, someone said this, and everybody just comes, ah, I'm PDP, I, this, 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 ah, during Jonathan, this thing happened, during Bari, this happened, and everybody just, you know, he said, she said, there's no actual intellectual property to everything, and we don't, we don't, we rely so much on he said, she said, when facts are actually on the ground. Is the APC administration fighting corruption? <laughs> Sorry, I just gave it to you like that. <laughs> <laughs> Selective corruption. I'll choose to answer that way. Selective corruption. That'll be my best answer. <laughs> they are fighting corruption, but selective. Yeah, selective corruption. Um, the reason why I say it's selective is that um, even within this government, like um, for me, within this government, there are a lot of things going on which I think has, has been allowed to slide. And you know, most of the people that have been gone out, gone after, are those from the, the, opposition. the opposition parties. You understand? You don't see anybody from the present party, regardless of what has happened. You know, being subjected to such, and it's it's dicey when you look at it. Come on, because I believe if you want to do it, I for me, I thought what this government would do when they entered power, 2015, was okay. See, whatever has happened has happened. But from now, this is the way it's going to go. And you draw quite a straight line about it. And then you start to operate within those parameters. But, well, unfortunately, <laughs> the Senate last week gave a nod to the independent candidature, candidacy bill. Are you happy about it? Um, you belong to a political party. It, you understand the intrigues. You understand yeah, the workings. It, you understand what it takes to... I remember your former presidential candidate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, you know? sure. Yes, things like that. So you tell us. You know, you, I mean, I'm talking to someone who has been there and has a good understanding of it. Independent candidature, will it in any way open the political space? Yes, it will, when it comes to smaller positions, being local government chairman and whatever. But when you look at a bigger position, like let's say House of Rep or Senate, there's a key factor you need to pay attention to. Nigeria is not that ready. Yeah, not that good with, with, <laughs> with voting. So we have this situation where you need people at words. Now, this is where imagine an independent candidate running for presidency. How many people is going to. There are 774 local governments. How many words do you think there are? There are like 10 in everyone. So let's just say 7,740. 10 is just me being minimal. 7,740 people. And of course, you're not going to put one person per, per, <laughs> per polling booth. So do you know what you're talking about? An independent candidate. Do you know how much he's going to spend? So I know for smaller pockets, like, you know, a local government, you could say, okay, I have 100 people that are going to stand my, at my polling booth and, you know, see, uh, make sure votes are counted right. Okay. But when you look at the whole holistic, it's, for me, it's a welcome idea. Right. But when you look at the cost, understanding yeah. the intricacies of politics in Nigeria, it's... It's not to change that much. Well, talking about same, looking at the bigger parties, looking at the not too big parties, and what have you, you know, what should Nigerians truly begin to look out for when it comes to who should lead us? This might come, this might come funny coming from me, being um, part of the political party and a strong part of it, but. I think Nigerians should stop looking at political parties. We should start to understand the credibility of the individual that is running. If a particular party brings you a lot of credible people, fine. You don't understand. Stand with them. But we have drunk ourselves so much on, ah, this party, the head is here. So especially if the head of the party is from this social region, everybody in that region just packs themselves here. This one's packed themselves the other way. You know, and we keep shouting, uh, no, the uh, marginalization. I, I don't understand Nigerians when they say marginalization. You marginalized yourself. Don't don't even go there. You marginalize yourself. How do you mean? When probably a individual is in power, 
everybody around him is from his area and that kind of thing don't the others have the right to say listen this is a commonwealth and we should all participate who put the individual in power the people who put the senators that can impeach the individual in power the people who can hold the senators accountable if they want the person in power removed the people but do they know it <laughs> That's the real question. <laughs> do they know this thing? Do they know that citizen participation gives... Do they know that truly power actually relies with the citizens or is with the citizens? Elijah, I'm not sure a lot of people know that. No, it lies. You know, Nigeria is a funny place. Um, we have a country where even senators that are supposed to be the closest people that are supposed to report directly from people. That's the reason for the Senate. Democracy was built around the Senate. Well, that's the fulcrum but, of democracy. Yeah, but um, you housed your senators in Abuja now. We housed our senators in Abuja. <laughs> so they're so far from their constituencies. <laughs> Let's be honest. No, we but what were you expecting? <laughs> that they should be coming from the yes. states? Yes. I'm no. hearing this for the first How time. How many times do they sit in a, in a week? Two Twice? Times. Three times? That's and then take a break for one month or two months abroad. Come on, let's be honest. They should actually come from their constituencies. They are far away from their constituencies, which is not supposed to be right. Well, anyway, I'm just hearing this aspect. And for it. me, considering how much we spend on them, mm. it's even cheaper paying for flights. Oh, really? Yes, no, and then what, we cut what, down what the allowances. What difference allowances. Will it make? Allowances are still there. No, I meant if the government feels, why build them houses? At what? So building that house costs more than it would pay to bring them here for four years. Hmm. Women participation in politics. Yeah, that's something I like to talk about. Let's talk about <laughs> like um, for me, um, I don't know, maybe it's, I always bring the African culture in, into it because I think that's what holds women in Africa back. But these days I've started to meet, you know, a few female aspirants and within my party I, I have like a very strong um, assistant national secretary I'm very proud of you know she's 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 young and she's an architect she's she's brilliant I've met a few female aspirants you know that have actually taken you know the reins of wanting to make a difference in uh, this thing but um, I think we still have a lot to go even to match the 35 I don't think we can match the 35 yet there are not enough women in the space but if we could promote women. Now, do you think there are not enough more women in the space? I, no, I, 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 so. I, I, no I, I, you know, I meet with political parties and I see what women want to become, women leader, or they want their husbands to be governor. That is their own idea of participation in politics, not actually bringing themselves out to run for some. For real? I'm yeah. hearing this for the first time. <laughs> you because don't whatever, that. anytime I get to interview women, this is not the notion I get. That's not the notion. Mm -hmm. What they believe and what actually happens are two different things. I've met, like I said, I've met a very, if a lot of great female politicians. politicians. But if you are going to say across board, board. as a majority, okay. you cannot, on, you cannot mm. subtract that. Mm. Yeah, there are about ten percent or fifteen percent that want to go out for political position. I even want to see a woman as president. Mm. I'd love to see that. But you, you, when you weigh what actually happens. They rather tussle over, you know, parties, these things, and then, you know, get a few funds to go and do this, do that. You know, it's the shorter cut. They're still participating in politics. That's you can't right. take that away, but it's the shorter cut. And, you know, you have just that select few that want to really go out, take that drive, you know, become something, you know, take their people somewhere. They're just, they're fewer than you imagine. You know, when you talk about youths coming together, <coughs> can we at this point say there is any form of synergy to change? The national question. If we are looking at transference or generational shift as far as politics is concerned, beyond probably coming to meet, discuss at conferences, symposiums, and what have you, and everybody goes home, can we say that anything is truly being done on ground to actualize this dream? You know, for uh, last elections, 2015, you didn't have a group of you sitting down for a conference, putting themselves together and saying, we all want to run for position. What are the problems in campaigns? What we didn't have that. Yes. We have that now. We're not mm -hmm. expecting to get to the end immediately. But I've noticed there are pockets of groups that have come together, regardless of party, regardless of who they are, they've come together and said, look, this guy is running for this here. This guy is running for this there. That guy is running for this here. And this is what we are going to do about it. 
let's come together under one wing. We might be different parties, but under one wing and say, look, put your strength into this person, put your strength into that person. Because what we're trying to do is totally shift it across board. That's right. And you think we can attain that? Even if we don't attain it fully, we would have set precedents in which in 2023 we would become the template to create the real shift. It doesn't really have to happen in our generation. We just have to start. Mm. Let's look at the economy. We just came out of a recession, or so we are told. How can we strengthen the economy? I get to ask everybody I meet this question, so it's not peculiar to you. How can we get to strengthen the economy? For me, um, first, um, Nigeria seems not to look at its greatest natural resource, and that is the human resource. And I'll give you a simple example. Some countries in trying to develop and trying to earn money, they found out, I think Singapore, they found out they were in between Europe and America. And they, they knew they had people. So they, they got together and then they put up call centers. Then, you know, they serve companies that work. That's Nike, Tommy Hilfiger. You're actually speaking to somebody in Singapore. Why? Nigeria is midpoint in Africa. Why hasn't anybody thought of that? This is just an example. I understand. That shows you the amount of potential. But, well, you know us now, we're drunk of oil. So, yeah. <laughs> and by 2020, I think it's going to be a clear picture is going to come to yeah. us. So I think Nigeria has not concentrated on its greatest resource, which is the human resource. And we should start to work on that. We have manpower. There's nothing we cannot do. There's nothing. I don't understand when states say they don't have anything. You have people. What, what do you need? All you need is people. Britain has nothing. But what do you use these people for? Because to a large extent, these people are now more of a burden I, than an asset. I gave an example. Why don't we build a call center? Why don't we have a massive call center? And then we call Benz and say, you know what? The call centers in Africa should run from Zamfara State. I have 600 people ready to answer phone lines. They're young. They speak English well. You could come and take it. This day. And then you sign it, an agreement with Benz, and you're done. Go to uh, this thing next. Go to, uh, let's say, BMW. Or go to ShopRite uh, Africa. Or go deal with people. It's not hard. You just need to find... A concept that works. This is this is me talking off the top of my head. This is an idea I just threw from nowhere. I understand. So it starts simple. What I think is the problem in Nigeria is not that we don't have what it takes to get there. What I think we, we don't have is the will to go there. All right. Talking about the judiciary, we've looked at politics, we've looked at the youths, we've looked at women, we've looked at the economy. The judiciary and the citizens the judiciary and the fight against corruption, where lies the way forward? As long as the judiciary remains controlled by the executive, we will never have an independent judiciary. And that breaks everything down. Because as long as the judiciary is not independent, it cannot function within, let me be honest, a sitting president should be afraid I'm not talking of this one, I'm just saying generally, a sitting president should be afraid to go to jail for things he has done during his presidency. Yeah, Till we have that kind of ideology, mm -hmm. even a senator, uh, for he should be afraid to go to jail for things he has done within the time he's serving. And that can only function within an independent judiciary. I don't think we ever think of that. No, no. Because when it comes <laughs> to the rule of law, when it comes to the rule of law, I think the laws are just for some people. Yeah, you know, I think... When George Orwell wrote, wrote The Animal Farm, he forgot to name it properly. He should have just written Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's why we have programs like this. I think it needs to come to the consciousness of people that whatever you do in office today, they just might be called upon to come and defend him tomorrow. If we don't get and if we don't start thinking like that, the level of impunity we have in governance today will just go on. Yeah, it's going to go on, and it's probably going to even explode. Because the truth is, nobody's held accountable for anything. I don't know what, I can buy, I can buy my, a governor sits down and he buys his assistants 95 cars. Oh, come on, stay money, I can spend it. And all from corrupt enrichment. And, and, and you don't, and nobody cares. But uh, all he needs to do is probably put up a statue or get a Christmas tree or do something. No, no offense, man. But uh, that's all he needs to do. I've seen a very strong campaign across the social media as it relates to the National Assembly calling on Nigerians not to recircle old politicians into the Senate after they become governors and what have you. Uh, is that campaign fair? Um, I think it's fair. 
because I've noticed that um, if you look at a trend, most governors that have served as governors have served not only have served and then when they noticed, especially that the next person coming in is not from their party, they struggle for the Senate because of the immunity that comes with being a senator. And do they have immunity? Senators yeah. don't have immunity. No, they do. No. They do. To oh, a particular level. To some they level. Do. Yeah, they do. To a particular level. At least better than being a free man. <laughs> <laughs> well, who is a free man? Because we are all under the law. <laughs> no, we when I mean a free law. man, I, I meant a common one. Yeah, yes. Maybe people like me. <laughs> yeah, like me and you. <laughs> <laughs> who can walk the streets of Africa <laughs> with no, no sirens? Sirens. And no SUVs. Ah. And nobody is bothering you. Yeah, nobody even notices. <laughs> So I, I think for because of that, they have learned to um, assimilate. And they also, they also want to remain politically relevant in their states or whatever. Sure. And I think it's become so much of a gimmick that it's becoming insulting. Mm. Kuli, as we round up, I want to find out from you. Tell us, what's your hard cry for Nigeria? If I were to say anything to Nigeria, it would be simply, we should realize that political participation of course exceeds voting. Nigerians must wake up to the fact that it is your right as a Nigerian to run for election. It is your right as a Nigerian to hold everyone accountable. You don't start and say, ah, the president did this. Why are you calling the president? You have a local government chairman. Okay, sorry, we only have three functioning. <laughs> I don't even need to talk about this. Right. But anyway, it's funny because we, we say we practice a democracy and democracy is supposed to, you know, the closest people to a demo, the closest people to a, a government to the people is local government. Yeah. And we only have a functioning, about three or four states functioning with lo elected local government. We have critical committees mm. that are stooges oh, of a governor. Yeah. So, I d mm. and we seem to be normal with it. I think this has gone too far. Nigerians must learn to understand politics. Pick up the constitution one day and read it. I'm sure that's something Nigerians don't read. They say if you want to hide something from a Nigerian, put it in a book. So, so read your constitution, understand, and then realize that even though life might seem good for you, you're working in Shell today or whatever, your gen next generation will be held accountable for the decisions you didn't take in this generation. That's true. So we must all learn to drive. Once we are able to hold everybody accountable, Nigeria is going to change. There will be no other option. When you know your senator, your senator knows he cannot go back to his constituency because you, you can't tolerate his actions. He, it will change. He will sit he up. Will sit up. He will make proper law. Your governor, if you start tell your governor, no, this cannot be done, and you hold him accountable, you push the state state uh, house of reps to hold him accountable for it. I don't think governors will move around with such impunity. But we've trained ourselves as Nigerians that the only thing we know as government is the president. Anything that happens, the president. Mm. There the are government. so many people mm. before that. That's right. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you very much. I have been talking with Mr. Kunle Lawal, who happens to be a management consultant. He's been sharing his thoughts with us on citizen participation, the anti-corruption drive, and what have you. Thank you so much for sharing your last one hour with us. Let's do same, same time tomorrow. I remain yours in service, Alpha Jack.